All right, so I know that I have population, parameter, sample, statistic, and with the parameter and statistics are the types of data which is categorical or quantitative, right? So then how do I get the sample? Like, so you keep telling me it's unlikely we're gonna get population. So now I have to select a sample, right? So how do I get that? Well, there are several sampling methods that can that can be meaningful to your study and give you great results. But the first thing we need to talk about is sampling bias. So if I wanted to represent a certain population, let's say I wanted to see the, uh, I'll say, what is the favorite pizza place that math for liberal, that liberal arts majors like, right? <laughs> And so what's the favorite pizza place that liberal arts majors like? So if I did that, would at SCC, let's, let's do a target population, only at Santiago Canyon College. So where, if I went to Fullerton College and surveyed liberal arts majors there and see what pizza place they liked, that would be some sort of bias in there, right? You're like, well, why are you saying that you want you want to see the favorite pizza place from SEC student liberal arts majors, but you're going to Fullerton for it? Eh, potato, potato, right? No, right? It's there's some bias. You're like, that's weird. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be you should be surveying SEC students. That's bias, where it's just like we need to make sure that every member of the population is equally likely to be chosen for the sample. We just want to make sure that we wouldn't, it's not likely if I'm at Fullerton College serving liberal arts majors of their favorite pizza place, it's highly unlikely I'm going to select any student that goes to SEC there. So therefore, that would be sampling bias and every member at SEC that's a liberal arts major doesn't have an equal chance, right? An equal opportunity to be part of my study. So we just need to make sure sampling bias occurs because we're not conscious of how we're taking our samples. So we have, I have a good example here of the Literary Digest. Um, they conducted a poll back in 1936 and they mailed out questionnaires, snail mail, and based on its result, the Literary Digest predicted Landon would win with the popular vote by 57%. And then Roosevelt won by 62%, um, percent, well, in actuality, that Roosevelt won. So this poll that the Literary Digest took actually said that Landon would win by more than half. But in real life, actually Roosevelt won by 62%. So what are some possible sample biases that could have contributed to the inaccuracies of their study? So when we think about um, Literary Digest, did they actually, did everyone that, every person that was voting for the next president during 1936 election time, did they have an equal chance of being selected for this sample? No, right? Like, no, they didn't. Only the Literary Digest subscribers. So they were actually doing sample bias. It wasn't a good representation of all voters that were voting, apparently, right? So one of the biases we would say is that um, the poll was only for subscribers. Subscribers. What are some other things? Right. Well, like I said, the sample they selected was not a good representation of the population. So um, sample was not a representation of the population of voters. And so this is how we kind of get that idea of fake news, because fake news does that. They take like a sample that is convenient for that question and the answer they're looking for. And it's just not a good representation. And this is why we have to be careful with news today, because there's so much fake news, you know.
Okay, so in this, how do we get, how do we avoid sample bias? Well, we first need to make sure our sampling is random. And even more so that a simple random sample. So a random sample is just when each member of the population has an equal probability of being chosen. And then if, if every member of the population and any group of members, then it's a simple random sample. Essentially, we just like random sampling. So if we identify all likely voters in a state, put each name of on a piece of paper and toss it into a very large hat and draw a thousand slips out of the hat. That's a random sample. It's literally blind selecting people. Now, essentially when you're doing voters, there are million, as we saw like in the last election, there was like about 150 million voters. That is way too much to put in a hat and randomly select. So we tend to always use um, technology. So if you were taking statistics and probability, you would be using stati real statistical software in research methods you do. You would use something strong like Minitab, SPSS, Microsoft Excel, R, there's a lot. In this class, we're just touching the water. We're just kind of giving you an overview so that you can go out in the world and understand all this data that's always presented to you in the marketing and voting and in the COVID-19 pandemic, right? We just want you to have a better understanding of what's being put in front of you. And so we're not going to have to be using these robust statistical software. We'll just use the calculator that we've been using throughout the course. Okay, but in this, right, sam to avoid sample bias, we need random sampling, but we can't help it. If we use the best software, we're still likely to maybe get a sample bias where we have to kind of resample um, the population. And this is, voting is always a great one because if, like I said, if we repeatedly take, let's say we put the hats and we randomly take a thousand samples over and over again, right? So some of these might high, have a higher percentage of Democrats or Republicans than the actual amount in the general population. We also may be selecting people who are older or more younger people or more female, more male, more African Americans, more Latinos, right? So there's the sampling variability, which is different than sample bias. Sample bias is inten has intent of being biased, but sample variability just means you are doing everything in your power to control to control that you get a simple random sample, but just of the luck of the draw that you're selecting, you get by you get the variability. So you can always revamp it and redo it or try a different method of sampling. So let's look. Let's take a look. So the first one is stratified sampling, and that's essentially when you just divide into subgroups and then select there. So how do how can we avoid, let's say in this last example, of selecting Democrats or Republicans, let's just say a two party, right? How can we um, make sure that the thousand people that we sample isn't all Democrats, right? So stratified would be maybe one answer where you would just split them up into Democrat and Republican and then take 500 from each, right? And then um, you could just split them up even for even in more subgroups, right? You could put Democrats in age groups or male, female, or, you know, however you, you would want to take your sample. But stratified is a good way to separate certain categories and then grab samples from the categories. Quota sampling is exactly um, stratified, but let's just say you don't have 500 Republicans in your sample, like in your whole population that you're grabbing hats from. Let's say you don't have 500 and you have 400. Then you take the 400 and the 600, and then you just use proportions in your, in your analysis. So quota sampling is just Democrats, but you're just taking samples in each group till it's met. You just take whatever you can get, right? So this is just when you're just going to meet a certain quota. 
Cluster sampling is if the population divided into subgroups and a set of subgroups are selected. So now what you're saying is, let's see here, you have subgroups, let's see, um, let's say Democrat, Republicans, and then here you're like, you know what, I just want to, I, I just want to assess the youth, the young, the young voters, 18 to 21. And so you have all these age groups, right, these ages, and then you have eight, you know, the, I'll put Y for young, and same with Republicans, right, a lot of ages, but here's the young, the youth. And you sample the entire age, the entire group. So cluster sampling means that you're taking the entire group of your subgroup. Whereas with Democrats, I'm sorry, as with stratified, you were taking subgroups, but just taking random subjects from those subgroups. Here, you're taking, you're splitting them into groups and the subgroups that you have, you randomly select that group, entire group. Systematic sampling, the next one, is every nth member. So every fourth customer. I always say the customer because that's how they do it in the grocery store. So you notice when you're in Costco or like the grocery store and they say, oh, you want to sample? Oh, you want to try? And they didn't ask you. And you're like, I wonder why they didn't ask me. What's wrong with me? I want a sample. And then you kind of volunteer yourself for the sample. That's exactly what um, that's exactly what they're doing, systematic sampling. So that way, no matter what, they're always getting every fourth person. And then if you jump in, then that's great. More mer the merrier for their sample. But the sam the systematic sampling will always occur because they need to get a certain number to meet their quota, right? And so they can guarantee every fourth customer and then it's random, right? Convenience sampling is is tricky because it can lead to bias, but if you do it right, you can actually get some good answers. For example, convenient sampling would be if you wanted to see the favorite pizza place of SCC students, you would just walk around campus and whoever passed you, you would ask. Now, that's not really biased because you're it's it is random like you're just randomly asking people in the quad so just you we have to be careful it just can't be where you are just sitting down in a classroom asking only the three people around you right but if you're walking through SEC and say hey what's your favorite pizza place what's your favorite pizza place then that's going to be a convenient sampling which is going to be okay um, voluntary response sampling so that's when you allow them to volunteer. So you, you, a lot of the times we send out surveys and we just want to know the student perspective. But do you think all 10,000 of our students is going to take the survey? No, it's the ones that volunteer. They click on the link and they decide to spend five minutes taking the quiz. I mean, quiz on <laughs> the survey. So um, voluntary is really up to the subjects and how many. So you may get in four, you may get in 5,000, you may get like 8,000, a lot of your population. It just depends. But voluntary is really up to the subjects and they're, they're wanting to be part of the survey. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples. If I went ahead and surveyed every fourth person in the class, then that was, which I just did, systematic sampling. Okay, sampling. All right, a sample was selected to contain 25 men and 25 women. I mean, sorry, and 35 women. So notice that these values are not equal. It's not 25 men, 30, 25 women. It's just, tw I, need, I need a sample of 60 and 25 and 35, can I just meet? So this is similar to the stratified sampling, right? Where you get them into groups and then select from those groups. But quota was when they weren't equal and you just did it till your quota was met. So this one would be quota sampling. If they were equal, we would assume the stratified.
Okay, viewers of a new TV show are asked to vote via the TV show's website. So we can think of American Idol. So just because you're watching the TV show, does that mean that you're going to vote? No, I wouldn't. I, I watched American Idol and sometimes I would vote and sometimes I wouldn't. It just depends how I felt. So it's really up to the viewers. It's up to the subjects in your study to, to volunteer. And that was the voluntary response sampling. In example D, a website randomly selects 50 customers to send a satisfaction survey. So they randomly selected, randomly random sampling random sampling, which is perfect, right? That's the ideal. Okay, last one. To survey voters in a town, a polling company selects 10 city blocks and interviews everyone who lives on those blocks. So if we looked up here in our little um, table, we would see that Stratified is when you split into subgroups and take random random people or subjects from those groups. Quota was like if is stratified but equal, uh, not equal. And cluster is when you take the entire group. So again, if you take the entire group, right? You don't pick from the group, you take the entire cluster, right? So here's the town and the polling company randomly selects 10 city blocks. So let me draw it so you can kind of see. So I'm going to do a four by four. Oh, no, no, let's do a four by five. So there's 20 blocks in the city. All right, here's block one, two, three, four, five, 10, 15? No, that doesn't make sense. 6, 7, 8, 12, 16, 20, 9, 13, 17, 17. Okay, so there is your city right? Your city has 20 blocks, but you're selecting 10. So now you took your city and put them in blocks. So there's your subgroups. Then you're going to take the entire subgroup. You're going to randomly select 10. There. So you take the entire group. This is clustering. Recall, it would have been stratified. It would have been stratified if I took subjects randomly out of each of these clusters, right? But because I took the entire city block to survey, it becomes a cluster sampling. The moment you start picking randomly out of each randomly block, then it becomes a stratified. Okay.